So we're back to um, minimum wage and starting off with taking a closer look at the tip to minimum wage. And Jamie, if you could help us set the stage, that would be great. Sure. <coughs> I think there's a handout. Uh, for the record, Damian Leonard, Legislative Council. There should be two handouts on the committee's webpage. I'm just pulling up my copies of them. Let's see. Okay. So I'll start with a little bit of background on tipped minimum wage, and then I'll just go through a side by side. Um, of some alternative approaches to the tipped minimum wage that could be taken in the minimum wage bill. So, um, as you may remember, right now our, our tipped minimum wage, which is the base wage that you have to pay to a tipped employee, is 50% of the regular minimum wage, so $5.25. If a tipped employee doesn't get at least $5.25 per hour in tips, the employer is required by law to bring them up to minimum wage. In most instances, tipped employees would get more than that per hour, but there could be instances like a slow shift or a big customer that didn't leave a tip or something like that where they may be, the, the employer would need to bring them up to the minimum wage. And, and that's each pay period? Sorry. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, every week. Okay. Uh, and so you true up at the end of the week. Okay. So it's actually, if you look down here in the fourth bullet there, so it's sufficient tips in a work week to okay. earn at least the minimum wage for all hours that week, and that allows for some fluctuation over the shift. Is it work week or pay period? Uh, it is in a work week. Um, and then, so your pay period may have one work week, two work weeks, most people have two. Um, and then uh, the default by law is, is one week, and then the employers can notify employees that they'll be going for two weeks or a different pay period um, there. So uh, I think most employers just tell employees when they start that you're going to be getting a bi-weekly check. So, um, so employees that can be tipped work in, the ho in hotels, motels, uh, so-called tourist places, and the restaurant industry. Um, and they have to customarily or regularly receive at least $120 per month in tips for direct and personal customer service. So uh, in a restaurant, back of the house workers uh, wouldn't be considered tipped employees. In a hotel, uh, someone like a bellhop or a parking attendant might be a tipped employee, uh, but someone else who works in the office wouldn't be a tipped employee. Um, the federal tipped minimum wage is $2.13 per hour, um, so that's, that's the absolute floor for the minimum wage nationally. Uh, and that hasn't increased since 1991 when it was decoupled from the federal minimum wage. Um, and then 26 states, uh, including every state in New England plus Washington, D.C., have a minimum wage that's somewhere above, or a tipped minimum wage that's somewhere above the federal tipped minimum wage, and an additional seven states, uh, mostly from, from Minnesota West, uh, have no tipped minimum wage, and they just have a single minimum wage regardless of whether or not you get tips. Um, and then 17 states have a tipped minimum wage that's equal to the federal tipped wage. So. Um, there's, as you can see, pretty good variability, and what I'll do here is just walk through a couple of different options that could be pursued. I see a question. I just, I'm just noticing that, so Washington, which is, I guess, just held as a standard on the, 15, as an example of the $15 minimum wage anyway. Washington State? Yeah. There are 1350 actually. Right, but they're, but they're the one of the first ones to go. Anyway, right. they don't have a tipped minimum wage. No, the entire West Coast does not have a tipped minimum wage. Uh, so Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, uh, they have all eliminated the tipped minimum wage. Uh, and then the other states are mostly in the Mountain West, um, with Montana and Minnesota, uh, and, or I'm sorry, Montana and Nevada, and the outliers, Minnesota, uh, in the Midwest there. And just one more question, on the $120 per month 
has that been changed in any <coughs> That, it's been a while since that's been changed. I can't remember off the top of my head when that was last updated. Uh, the federal amount is, uh, I think, only $30. Um, so it's quite a bit lower, but the $120 hasn't been updated for a while. So I could find out when. It's just, it comes out to like six hours a week or something like that for receiving tips mm -hmm. or whatever. Do you have information about um, how the provinces approach this? Particularly uh, No, I can find out for you though. Um, yeah, I could look at what Quebec's minimum wage law is. I think Canadian minimum wage on average is a little bit under 10 US dollars per hour. Um, and I know there's a, it varies from a low in the Maritimes and I can't remember where the high Canadian minimum wage is, um, but I can get you those numbers. I came across them the other day. Uh, and I know that there's some talk about going to a national minimum wage in Canada um, or about the national government adopting a minimum wage that preempts the provincial minimum wages. Um, but I don't know if that's just a couple of members of the Canadian Parliament or if that's a, a real substantive push. So um, it's sometimes hard to tell when you're you're just reading articles whether it's just one or two members who are outspoken or uh, a real coalition. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So um, first option, of course, is no change in the minimum wage. So it would continue to be 50% of our standard minimum wage which means that when the minimum wage reaches $15, uh, it would be at $7.50. So um, whatever date the minimum wage would reach $15 at. Um, an alternative is to decouple the two and increase the tipped minimum wage by the CPI or 5%, whichever is less, which means the tipped minimum wage would keep pace with inflation. Um, and basically grow at the same rate as it would if we didn't uh, change the minimum wage uh, through S40. Um, but if the minimum wage was increased, that means the gap between the two would gradually grow um, because you'd be working from a smaller base with the tipped minimum wage <coughs> once the actual minimum wage started to increase by inflation. Um, and the actual minimum wage, at least as S40 is drafted, would outpace inflation for about six years. Uh, and this is similar to Washington, D.C., whose tipped minimum wage uh, is currently below $5. It's going to reach $5 in 2020 and then increase by the CPI after that. Uh, and as you'll remember, their, their regular minimum wage is going up to $15. Uh, another option um, is to freeze the tipped minimum wage at $5.25. An example of this is Massachusetts to our south, whose tipped minimum wage is at $3.75 per hour. Um, so there are a handful of states across the country that have done this, somewhere above the federal tipped minimum wage, uh, but less than their minimum wage. Um, another option is to uh, reduce or actually increase the difference between the minimum wage and tipped minimum wage. Um, and there are two ways to do this. Uh, you could change the ratio um, of the wage. So right now we're at half. Uh, New York has their <coughs> set of two thirds, um, or 750, whichever is more. So as a practical matter, it's going to be two thirds the minimum wage as their wage climbs. Uh, you could set a fixed tip credit, uh, which Arizona is a three dollar tip credit. My favorite tip credit is Colorado, which is three dollars and two cents. I have no idea where the what two is, cents come from. What does that mean, a fixed tip credit? So it basically means that an employer is allowed to credit the first $3 in tips that an employee uh, earns towards the minimum wage that would be due to the tipped employee. Uh, so in our state, we effectively have a $5.25 tip credit by setting the tipped base wage at 50%. Okay. And their state, instead of saying, it's a percentage, they say, subtract $3 from whatever the minimum wage is, and there's your tipped wage. Okay. 
That's just a different way of saying it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so New York's approach is similar to Vermont's law. The second approach would allow for quicker growth in the tipped minimum wage, and it also makes for easier math. Um, the fifth option is to eliminate the tipped minimum wage. This could be done immediately or gradually. Uh, the, as I mentioned, there are seven states that have done this. Maine had initially passed when they updated their minimum wage, was initially going to eliminate the tipped minimum wage. They rolled back that elimination of the tipped minimum wage uh, this past fall. Um, and then the other option, like I mentioned before, is to reduce the tipped minimum wage. So instead of at 50%, it could be like New Hampshire where it's 45% of the standard minimum wage or a fixed amount below 50%. Um, and the only, the only limitation there is you can't go below the federal minimum wage. So those are the options. Um, let me show you now the side-by-side um, the -side of these different approaches and what they would look like. Um, and this is pretty small, so it probably makes sense to zoom in so we can look at one at a time uh, or two at a time. There we go. That's, that's actually, can everybody read that? Yeah, or do we need to go a little closer? Okay. So uh, the left column here is no change to the existing law. Um, so this is the latest projections on inflation, uh, the latest consensus projections we have here. So uh, if, the, if S40 didn't pass and the existing law stayed the way it is, uh, we'd reach $12.16 an hour in 2024. Uh, at which point the tipped minimum wage would reach 608. So you can kind of see that uh, gradual steady growth here. Um, Inflation is expected to be a little higher uh, in the first few years and then level out around 2.2% per year uh, in the out years. Um, so if we uh, pass S40 as currently written with no change to the tipped minimum wage language, uh, you can see the growth here is, is quicker. Um, and by uh, 2024, uh, you'd reach a tipped minimum wage of $7.50, which is about $1.42 in nominal dollars more than the existing tipped minimum wage. And in real dollars, um, you know, $2018, uh, it would be less than $1.42. I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, I'm not good, at, not good at those inflation calculations off the top of my head here. If we increase by the CPI, so this is basically if the tipped minimum wage increased uh, as if it would if there was no change in the existing law, and then the minimum wage increased uh, as set forth in S40, uh, what you can see is um, that gradually growing gap that I described between the minimum wage and the tipped minimum wage there as uh, it you know, would be almost $9 more uh, than the tipped minimum wage by 2024. Um, and then uh, the next column here is just an example of how to eliminate the tipped minimum wage by 2024, what it would look like. Uh, in terms of the increases that uh, that businesses would see in terms of the base wage they would need to pay employees. And I figured it out to be roughly uh, a dollar and 62 and a half cents. Um, so we went with a dollar 62 in the initial years and a dollar 65 in the last year. Um, but as you can see, it's uh, year over year, it's a fairly substantial increase. Uh, and if you compare it, you can just see here the tipped minimum wage under S40. Um, so you can see the difference here. Uh, in the first year under S40, we're at 555. In the first year already under the elimination of the tipped minimum wage gradient, we're at 687. Uh, and that gap grows to uh, $7.50. Um, between those two models by the end as the tipped minimum wage goes away. And then after that, these would just stay in lockstep going forward um, with an inflationary increase 
this next example here is just setting a fixed tip credit like Arizona, the three dollars. So it just banks for really easy math as we do the inflation increases on the minimum wage, just subtract three dollars, and that's your tipped minimum wage. But as you can see, again, your tipped minimum wage increases more quickly uh, than it would be under the percentage model. Um, and so that's that's one of the things here as time goes on under that model and the minimum wage gets higher, the relative buying power of the tipped minimum wage increases um, because that difference relative to the minimum wage becomes smaller and smaller. Um, and then finally, the frozen example here just shows you the differences you can see in each year. Uh, if we kept a tipped minimum wage at 525, where we would be at. So those are the examples. Um, obviously, there's probably a 15,000 permutations of, of all of these different models. Um, but that just gives you some sense of what the different options are. Um, and all of these options have an example somewhere. Um, so it's just a question of really you know, the policy that the committee wants to pursue. Any questions? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, while I'm doing a check here, I believe that D we don't have DOL here yet. Oh, yeah. Not till 10. Um, both Cameron and Dirk are coming at 10. Cameron's one with the type frame, but yes, they're both coming up. Okay. Um, Isaac, are you ready yeah. to yeah, stand up? Yeah, that's fine. That would be a lot of time. Okay. Please have a seat. Yeah. Yes, I'm happy. Representative Reed is here. Um, yes, Representative Christie is here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. For the record, Isaac Graham, uh, Political Engagement Director with Rights and Democracy in Vermont. Um, so I Ron emailed you two pieces of testimony, but it wasn't super long ago. So no, it should sure. be there. Okay, great. <clears throat> so um, don't need uh, to take up a lot of your time. Just wanted to provide a, a little bit of background on tipped minimum wage um, and share a little bit of testimony with a tipped minimum wage worker who wanted to be here but couldn't make it because they have to work. Um, so uh, just very quick background for those who I haven't been able to explain what rights and democracy is yet. Uh, we're a membership-based organization in Vermont and New Hampshire. <laughs> Uh, and we do local popular education and grassroots advocacy around issues of social, racial, and economic and environmental justice. Um, and so we've been focusing a lot on the minimum wage campaign as a means of uh, reducing income inequality and poverty in the state. And um, we really appreciate you giving this so much thought um, and weighing the issue. Uh, and when it comes to tip minimum wage, our position is that um, at the very least, uh, the bill should not decouple the tip minimum wage from the minimum wage. Um, it's very important to tip minimum wage workers that they're not relying super heavily on uh, tips for their income. Uh, it just creates a sense of instability and disproportionately creates problems for uh, women in the tipped workforce who uh, are kind of forced into a, a position where they have to is the customer no matter what, and it leads to more problems of uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, two thirds of tip minimum wage workers are women, so this is very much an issue that disproportionately impacts women. Um, much of what's in the, the kind of briefing on the tip minimum wage, uh, in terms of the background, was covered just now. Um, but a few facts to highlight um, there are, as Damien mentioned, seven states uh, in the United States that do not have a tip minimum wage. Uh, in those states, they have robust restaurant industries that have managed to thrive, um, and workers in those industries 
uh, have more stability in their take-home pay uh, and don't have to face the same issues of um, lack of the numbers being on the books in terms of getting credit. So, um, I'll wait a moment. I think it's okay. <laughs> I'm all in process. So, uh, you know, the, the, the tip minimum wage being a thing is not, uh, it's not always been there. This is essentially relatively, you know, newer development over the last number of decades. Um, so there was no such thing as a tipped sub-minimum wage um, for the first 30 years of there being a federal minimum wage. Um, that was changed in 1966 when those folks were brought into uh, being actually part of having a minimum wage. Um, and at that point, it was uh, set to 50%, uh, which has been raised and then lowered at, at different periods over the last few decades. Um, and it's been frozen nationally at 213 since 1996. Luckily in Vermont, there's been some good legislation to make that a better situation for tip, made, tip workers. Um, a few things on, on Vermont. 43% uh, of tip workers are waiters and waitresses. Um, on average, those, are, those workers are earning around 14 an hour, um, meaning that about 70% of their um, income is reliant on tips rather than their base wage. Um, and the problem with that being that there's instability and changes depending on what kind of shifts those workers get. Um, <coughs> you know, um, it's not ideal for anyone to, to not have that kind of stability in terms of what they can expect to take home on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Um, on the second page, if you can see that on your computers or here, um, just to break down a little bit of median wage and average wage um, for tipped workers in Vermont. And I'm not going to dive into those numbers too deeply, but just for the benefit of the committee to be able to see those numbers. And <coughs> <clears throat> so, I don't really, uh, I don't have to dig too much deeper into this, but I um, would encourage members to review the numbers um, and Could to just keep in mind, yes? Look at that chart right there. Most restaurant servers in Vermont are only slightly above the minimum wage. <clears throat> um, so the only other piece I wanted to highlight from this at the end is that um, the <coughs> restaurant industry is, is strong in Vermont and can afford to um, adapt to an increasing tip minimum wage. Um, if the uh, tip minimum wage were to be eliminated over the next six years, um, I think that you would just want to hear from the restaurant industry on that. I'm sure that they'll be contacting and, and testifying. Um, I know that it, the experience in Maine with their attempt to eliminate the tip minimum wage um, over a 10 year period was met with very intense resistance. Um, so I think that uh, the increase of the minimum wage to 15 an hour that can bring up the tip minimum wage at least over this period um, to 750 and given that they are required to make at least the minimum wage, that will be a huge benefit for tipped workers. Um, and the more that we can move toward a system, uh, and I think it probably just in practical terms needs to be a bit of a longer process, but the more that we can get towards eliminating tipped wage and having a fair wage for all, the more it will create stability for those workers, the more it will protect uh, the women who are the majority of those working for tips uh, that are in this industry. Um, so just a number to highlight, the sales of restaurants in Vermont are expected to reach almost $800 billion this year, uh, which is a 4.3 increase over last. Um, so the restaurant industry is, is doing well and I think could accommodate changes of this nature if they're done um, in, in a way that restaurants can adapt over time to that change. I know that there's a cultural kind of an educational shift that needs to happen uh, for that to, to work out, but it can certainly be done as the seven states that 
currently have one fair wage for the test tube. Um, and then I have, this was also submitted to the record, uh, testimony from Andy Sopranic, who is um, a Vermonter who works for tips uh, in the restaurant industry. Uh, he didn't want to mention what restaurant, um, but was willing to at least share a bit of his testimony. And I'll just highlight a few things that he mentioned. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see where to start. I don't have to read the whole thing to you all, but um, I've worked in the restaurants as a server for years. Many of my closest friends and loved ones also work in the service industry. I have a deep respect for the work ethic required of those who choose this line of work. But to make a living wage based on tips is inconsistent and often means odd hours, more tables per server, few breaks, and lack of benefits. It is a demanding job that takes a particular dedication and skill that can only be obtained after years of experience. Serving is quickly be, being recognized as a skilled craft as it should be. A minimum wage increase for tip workers and for all Vermonters would show that their hard work is valued. Um, skip to the third paragraph. Uh, paying a living wage would encourage more like me to seek work here in Vermont. The service industry has grown over 85% since 1990, more than most other sectors. However, as the number of tipped workers continue to grow, they remain in the bottom quarter of all wage earners. Much of the tourism that sustains our communities is made through ever-expanding food and beverage businesses. It's a big draw for tourists to check out Vermont's award-winning restaurants and breweries. The summer and fall see a huge spike in business and tipped workers become highly sought after. Uh, a raise in the minimum wage would entice more young people to seek such work and create more incentive to stay here in Vermont. Um, I love what I do, I find my work worthwhile and satisfying, but unlike other types of employment, relying on tips to meet a livable wage can be very inconsistent. It's difficult to predict if there will be enough on my paycheck each week. Close to one out of six tipped workers and their families live in poverty, often requiring the help of public support programs. Tipped workers make up 46% of the share of workers who require federal assistance. While it's great that these options are available, they are not meant to be in place as permanent fixtures of one's income. Um, then, so that's, those are just pieces that I wanted to highlight from testimony from one tip worker um, and to give a bit of background on the tip minimum wage and why we believe that it, it should not be decoupled from the minimum wage and that we should think about a longer conversation of how we can get towards one fair wage for all workers in the state so that folks are not having to rely on inconsistent uh, income and having instead of one boss at the place they work, having dozens of bosses every day who determine how much their actual income is, which I think for women especially causes a lot of issues. That's all. Any questions? Questions? Uh, uh, Representative Reed? Can you go up to the third paragraph? Actually, it's the second paragraph. I'm sorry. Um, we, we skipped over. You skipped over that second paragraph, and I just want to highlight one area where he says, "As I find my way through the ever-changing job market, I have chosen the service industry as a way of supporting myself. I enjoy this work and have chosen it over other occupations." So, just highlighting the fact. Nobody's making him do this. There's always options. He can rise through it. He can go and own a business in what you refer to as a virgin egg restaurant industry in the state. And, uh, you know, and then he'll do what he wants. But just to keep, to keep the burden talk. You know? <laughs> sure. Just, yeah. just a, a quick response to that. I would just say that, yes, people have a choice, but they're is a service industry in Vermont, and there is a need to fill those jobs. So there will always be people, like we need people to work in those jobs. So yes, they have a choice, but there is always a pool, and you know, over the last number of decades, more and more of that pool of labor that we need um, is low wage work. So yes, I, I hear your point, but there are those jobs, they exist. Yes, and I want those, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Sherman. Um, uh, are you suggesting um, that in the long run we have a uh, minimum wage for, remember this isn't a livable wage, this is minimum wage. So we're talking about two very different things, but um, 
Um, are you suggesting we we eliminate that we have a minimum wage that is consistent across the board? That yes. To, I would be. Um, I would. Uh, I would challenge you to find um, a server who wants to get rid of the t tips. <laughs> that wants to re. I, I would uh, challenge you because they. They make a pretty good living I, uh, I in agree most with cases. I, agree with you. I know some myself. <laughs> I uh, I would um, I think uh, I think that is a um, frankly a, a uh, silly. So I hear you. But I, I would challenge you to find uh, find a waiter and a bar or a bartender who would choose to work minimum wage rather than work for tips. What? So I I've, I've, I've certainly heard that from some folks, and I think especially for. Tip workers in, in higher end restaurants and, and like higher um, traffic, uh, you know, bars and restaurants. That is very true. Um, I, I I have spoken with some, and just to say that there's not none. I, I've, I've spoken with folks who are in more like low income housing. I remember a woman who, when I was canvassing, um, I used to knock a lot of doors for this, and so um, she worked for IHOP, and she talked about what a nightmare that was um, when they would have many shifts that they didn't have very many folks coming in. But they got canvases. the minimum wage. They were paid the minimum wage at that point. Mm -hmm. Every pay period. If they don't get the minimum wage via the tips and, the, and their wage, then they get paid the minimum wage every pay period, so. Any, any other questions for us? Thank you. Thank you very much for the time to speak. Thanks. Thank Um, so now we have um, a couple of representatives from DOL, Dirk Anderson, General Counsel, and Cameron Wood. Okay. Um, are you separate? We're okay. together. All right. We, we have you listed on the agenda first as Cameron and then as Dirk. So do it that way. Or you can go side by side. Or you can go side by side too. Dirk Anderson, General Counsel, Department of Labor. Cameron Wood, I'm the Unemployment Insurance and Wages Division Director with the Department of Labor. Okay. And so we are taking up the minimum wage, focusing particularly on tip wages this morning, but um, there may be other information that the department can share with us. That is our primary focus this morning, is tip wages. Um, so I think to, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess we're not really sure what what the questions are. I mean, we do um, we do have a wage and hour division that um, enforces the minimum wage law that includes the tip wage law. Um, we do receive calls, questions, complaints. Um, what I can say, um, specific to tip wages, and we've been asked this question before is um, you know what percentage of the claim of the claims that we get are from employees receiving tips um, what percent you know we were asked are there people who wind up receiving less than the minimum wage because they get lousy tips and the employer doesn't make up the difference um, and the majority that is a that is a very, very small number of, of claims. We went back over the past two years and looked at um, complaints to the Wage and Hour Division, and out of slightly more than 100 complaints about unpaid or underpaid wages, um, roughly 10% of those were from tipped employees, and only two of those wound up being about um, receiving less than the minimum wage at the end of the week when their tips did not, when the employer did not bring them up to the minimum wage by making up the difference between what they actually received in tips and what the minimum wage was. So we don't hear a lot of complaints 
um, specifically about that. The majority of the questions and complaints we get about tip wages have to do with tip pools and employees who feel tip pools aren't being um, administered equitably and um, those are, you're probably aware that <clears throat> You know, tip pools are allowed under federal law. There are some um, limitations um, on how tip pools can be um, can be distributed under the Fair Labor Standards Act, and um, we do receive complaints about that. And and it's those are very hard complaints to investigate because you know not all the tips are on credit cards, some of them are cash. Um, if they're distributed, maybe I'm getting out in front of myself, but um, the, the general guidance under the Fair Labor Standards Act currently, and again, the current federal administration is looking at changing this, but um, currently, you're only supposed to share, if you do tip pool, you're only supposed to distribute those tips to um, employees who actually receive tips. So, and those are the kind of complaints we get, that some of the tips get <coughs> spread out amongst kitchen staff who aren't normally considered tipped employees. Um, we sometimes get complaints that, you know, the manager or front of the house person or the owner may be retaining a portion of the tip pool for themselves. Um, and the S40, um, at least as, you know, as it's drafted now, um, as it came out of the Senate, um, does specifically say that tip pools are okay as long as those tips are just distributed amongst employees who regularly receive tips. So that would address that concern. I've got a couple of questions, and this is new to me, so please um, bear with my ignorance. Uh, the purpose of tip pools, is that because of shift differentials? I mean, why do restaurants have them? Um, I believe the general concept behind tip pools is that you may have, I mean, somebody may just get a big table and they're a bunch of lousy tippers and you spend an hour and a half with them and they leave you nothing, whereas somebody else got a lovely couple who left them 30%. Um, I believe the general concept is it's a way to sort of even out inequities that result from just um, you know discrepancies, uh, variations between what people tip, who may have a good table one night, who may have a bad okay. table. I, I think that's a general idea. So the, in general, it's not somebody who works an afternoon as opposed to somebody who works dinner? Or... No. No. And, and uh, uh, do you have a sense of how common they are? How common a practice that is? I think it's a fairly common practice. Mm -hmm. I couldn't put a percentage on it, but mm -hmm. we certainly do get calls about it. All right. Thank you. You have calls about the distribution of tip jars and delis and other sort of counter situations? I don't know if it's specifically, I think we have had those calls. What percentage of tip pool questions that is, I don't know. Yeah, I would say we, we get those calls. Uh, the, the initial question would be, are you uh, a tipped employee? If you're not a tipped employee, then you don't you know, have the right to, to those tips. So. But just to reiterate what Dirk was saying, um, as far as uh, the, the tipped employees go, we don't receive complaints that they're not receiving minimum wage. It, it's a lot of, um, you know, the, the employer um, isn't giving them any wages or the employer is closing, they haven't received their last check. That's really a lot of the complaints we receive. So a previous witness had a, sh had a document that I'm not sure how much it pulled from Vermont's uh, DOL statistics, but it just was giving an average wage in a job classification, and it had waiters and bartenders and 
14 to 15 dollar an hour range how do you as a, how do you determine what that is um, for those kinds of statistics and whether or not those were actually your statistics I do think Vermont does does Vermont publish um, average wages Vermont does how how we arrive at those numbers would really be a question for our economist, Matt Barowitz, head of the Labor Market Information Division. Um, but we do publish and up regularly update um, average wages um, by job class. And that information is on our website. I, I don't know what you were shown recently, but we do maintain that information on our website. We'll keep it up to date. Yeah, it's just, it, for me, it's, so if you have an average that's saying that there's some people who make below that or above that, and you know, I've heard comments from local restaurateurs that their wait staff makes substantially more than fourteen dollars an hour. You know, so getting at facts versus anecdotes and how those facts are derived versus then how the anecdotes are derived is going to be important to me to sort out to tease out what we're really talking about here when it comes mm -hmm. to tip wages. Um, how would you enforce? Um, how would you inf how would you be able to enforce a complaint um, uh, of someone saying I'm not getting the minimum wage because I didn't make any tips this week? Um, the way we enforce any wage complaint, if we get a complaint, um, we take an initial look at the complaint, the complainant's allegations. If it looks like what they're alleging is um, is in fact a wage violation or a tip wage violation, we will then reach out to the employer um, and say, you know, here's what your usually ex-employee, um, not always, has, has said, um, do you have any information um, to, you know, that you'd like to give us? And we ask them to give us payroll records and uh, we do a little investigation and if we find that wages are owed we issue a determination um, finding that wages are owed and how many wages are owed um, if the employer either pays that or they appeal it um, we have for five or six years now um, five or six years ago the legislature revised um, section 342a to create a more formal appeals process for wage and hour violations, which we now have in place and which is actually working pretty well. Um, so there's a statutory right to an appeal by either party. Um, there's an evidentiary, evidentiary hearing before an administrative law judge in the Department of Labor. They issue a determination or a decision with findings of facts and conclusions that is appealable to the Employment Security and then once a determination or a decision becomes final, we send, if we find that wages are owed, we send the employer a final letter saying, you know, this is a judgment, uh, it's a final judgment because there's been no further appeal, X amount of wages are owed, and then if they don't pay that within whatever we ask them to pay it in 10, 20 days, um, we send it to our collections attorney who pursues a um, collection action in Superior Court. So that's the process. That's the process. The only thing I would I would add to it is that it can be extremely difficult in um, you know the, the service industries because uh, these people are dealing with cash most of the time, and it's very difficult when an employer doesn't have. Uh, accurate records, it really turns into a, you know, I don't want to make it sound trivial, but a he said, she said, and at that point it, it's, you know, who is more credible. Um, so that they can be difficult to enforce in that instance, especially with the tip pooling. Um, you know, if a, you know, if a complainant says they're not receiving an adequate portion of the tip pooling, then it's, you know, are they aware of how much was in the tip pool? Is the employer aware? And it's just it's, um, because of the, the nature of the cash, it can be very difficult to, to track. And So you, you run into circumstances where that has been the case? And yes, ma'am. And that's why you know, we always try to advise employers, even in, especially in these industries, uh, when you're dealing with cash. I mean, having accurate records is, 
uh, a way to protect yourself yeah. from these situations. If you don't, then it, like I said, it becomes an employee claiming that, that they're not receiving their share of the tips. And if you can't document uh, what they're receiving or, or um, you know, what the overall tip pool arrangement is just on that topic, um, you know, it can come back and, and it be <coughs> difficult to find in your favor. The, also, in the last witness, they stated that of the tipped employees, and I'm, again, I'm not sure if he was quoting national numbers or state numbers, that 59% of them work in restaurants. And tipped employees also include others that, that are in the statute. Um, who do you come across as other tipped wage employees? Um, you know, people who are paid this minimum, this tip minimum, and you know, I mean, doormen, uh, chambermaids, uh, hotel. I mean, they say hotel workers. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what other workers there are that we have in, in Vermont that, that qualify under the under the law as being a tip wage individual. Well, uh, the statute allows. Uh, there's two requirements in order to be considered a tipped employee and receive the tip wage under the statute. One is that they work in a, I believe the statute refers to it as a hotel, motel, restaurant, or tourist place, which is kind of old-timey language. But, um, <laughs> so it has to be hotel, restaurant, tourist place, and they have to customarily receive at least $120 a month in tips. Um, in terms of other employees who may receive tips, like chambermaids, we don't, we haven't really had tip complaints from them. Um, we, I, we believe anecdotally that almost all chamber people are paid minimum wage rather than treated as tipped employees. I do know that um, that's that question came up in the Senate Economic Development Committee, and that committee was going to follow up with representatives of the hotel industry to find out, you know, whether or not the industry practice was to treat all um, cleaning people, chamber people, as minimum wage people. And I don't, I don't know whether they got that information, um, but. I'm sorry, I can who check was seeking them. that information? The in? Senate Economic Development Committee. Um, earlier this session, um, when we were talking about tips, um, it seemed to me that they were going to reach out to the hotel industry for that information. I don't, I don't know if they did but or not. But have you made any kind of ruling in the department related to whether this, this group of workers working in hotels are considered tipped workers? Um, they would have to customarily receive more than $120 a month in tips. And again, we haven't had any complaints from that, that we're aware of um, from cleaning people, chamber people who have said, I get paid the tip wage and I don't make enough in tips to meet the minimum wage. We haven't had a complaint. In that instance, I think we would look at the, the specific case, the facts. I don't think we would make a determination that you know all chambermaids are, are tipped employees. We would look at that individual and see uh, the key would be whether they're receiving $120 a month in tips. Um, Representative Priestley. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Well, it, it seems the statute's pretty clear, you know, so there's no ambiguity there. <laughs> you know, if you made $120, then that's the baseline. But what's fascinating is um, when we look at, you know, our industry, you know, being tourism, you know, so strong in the state, um, a lot of the uh, uh, organizations are, I, I've got constituents who work in that market uh, that provide different services that uh, fall into that category. Uh, and what I'm getting, you know, the spa people, you know, that work with, uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, the resorts and um, the hotels, you know, in our in our area, um, and depending on, you know, their their skill set and their strength, 
you know, make a pretty decent, you know, uh, not only wage, but also uh, their tip average is pretty consistent, you know, as well. Um, but I would imagine that if there was a complaint, you know, you'd be able to disaggregate that fairly, fairly easily, I would think, um, you know, from what we've heard so far. Um, so you wonder, we don't get a lot of those uh, on average? No, sir, I would say the, the majority of the complaints we get from, uh, from a tipped employee would be from the, the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I was surprised to hear earlier that the, uh, the truing up of the, uh, the tips to the minimum wage is done on a weekly basis instead of a pay period. Um, has it always been like that? And has that ever come up as a um, as It has always <coughs> been on a weekly basis, yeah. um, as far back as, as I can recall. Yeah, I know most restaurants are on a weekly, but a lot of bigger. Other questions on tipped wages? Well, while we've got you, um, we had testimony early on around the youth wage. And we'd like to have a sense from you of, of how the department interprets the current statute related to the youth wage. Um, certainly. What your experience has been. So, um, when you say youth wage, there's... Or student wage, a student I wage. So, Vermont's uh, minimum wage subchapter uh, contains a series of exemptions. One of those exemptions, and I don't have my... Oh, okay. <coughs> um, is for a student working during all or any part of the school year or regular vacation periods. So a student working during the school year or a regular vacation period is exempt from Vermont's minimum wage law. The department has interpreted that and continues to interpret that to exclude the summer break. Because if you don't exclude the summer break, the subsection becomes kind of meaningless because it would be always. So students working during the summer break in Vermont are, according to us, entitled to Vermont's minimum wage. Um, the statute does clearly exempt them if they're working during the school year. Um, so at that point, you have a couple of fallbacks. If they're exempt from Vermont minimum wage, then they're subject to federal minimum wage which is still 725. There's a sub exemption under, there's an exemption under the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act for um, what are called, I believe, student learners, which allows an employer to pay a minimum wage of 425 an hour for up to 90 days to a high school student. So it's considered a training wage or a learning wage. Um, we don't get any complaint. We haven't had any complaints about somebody saying, hey, I'm being paid $4.25 an hour. I think I ought to be paid more. We've had a couple of questions about that, um, but we, we haven't had a complaint involving a sub-federal minimum wage earner. Um, so in theory, it's possible that a student working during the school year could be employed for up to 90 days at 425 an hour, be compliant with federal law, be compliant with Vermont law. But again, um, we haven't had any complaints about that. And I think anecdotally under Vermont's current employment climate of you know, employment rate <coughs> sub 3%, Nobody's going to work for four twenty-five an hour, but it's it's theoretically possible. Um, so because the, of Vermont's minimum student minimum wage exemption. So um, with students, you're looking at um, essentially high school students. 
Yes, and again, the stat the statute says student. It doesn't say high school student, but that's how we've interpreted it. The, the only thing I would add is the other thing we will look at is was there an agreement between the employer and the student? So if the employer agrees to hire them at, you know, let's say $9 an hour or 10 11 whatever the agreement is, that's what we would enforce. We wouldn't go by what? Just a, a blanket. I'm allowed to pay them seven. If you agree to pay them ten, then that's what you're. That's what you're going to pay them. If you agree to pay them nine, that's what we would enforce. And we do get complaints, not necessarily subminimum wage, but just we regularly get complaints about employees who say, "Hey, I was hired. They told me they were going to give me thirteen dollars an hour. I got my first paycheck. It was twelve dollars an hour." Um, we will investigate those complaints. Um, Again, generally, if there was an oral agreement, it's going to be hard for us to enforce. But if there's something in writing, we, we will enforce that. Representative Fields, do you get any complaints from high school students at all? We, we get complaints from their parents. <laughs> <laughs> generally, their mothers. <laughs> Dirk has been involved in this program a lot longer than I have, but I can't think uh, off the top of my head of receiving a lot of complaints of, of high school students being paid $7 an hour. Uh, I think it's more in line with the, the majority of complaints we get from uh, other individuals, which is I have an employer who's refusing to pay me you know, what the agreed upon wage was. Mm -hmm. And wages for 14-year-olds, 16-year-olds, those all fit under the student category? I mean, some 14-year-olds can work under certain conditions? 14 and 15-year-olds can work under some limited conditions. <coughs> Obviously, 16 and 17-year-olds can work under most <coughs> conditions except explicitly enumerated hazardous occupations. Um, but during the school year, they would all fall into that student working during all or part of the school year, minimum wage exemption. And, and do you have records of people, again, to add, you said anecdotally no one has complained about it, but is there any way to track where, you know, employers know where employers are paying less than, aside from like agricultural workers, we tend to assume that they're allowed to pay less than the minimum wage, but, you know, I, I just don't know what, who, who's employing, based on what you just said, who's going to work at 425 or even 725 an hour if they're not receiving tips on top of that? If somebody is working for a sub-minimum wage, um, we probably wouldn't know about it unless we got a complaint. Um, we do receive, a, Cameron, maybe you can... Correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, most of the wage information that we have available to us either comes through responses to employer surveys, which is what the Labor Market Information do Division does, or wage information that's reported when employers fill out their quarterly unemployment insurance tax reports. Um, but those reports, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, just report <coughs> aggregate gross wages paid in a quarter. Are they broken down by um, wage? I don't recall off the top of my head if we ask for the actual hourly rate. I know we ask if the individuals are salary or hourly on the unemployment insurance quarterly report. Um, I know Matt Barowitz, our economist, did some um, analysis of the hourly wage um, information that we have on employment information and in, in my recollection of talking with him about that it was very difficult to to attest to the accuracy of that information because when we were doing the analysis we ran into a lot of instances where people you know if, if it were true they were being paid two dollars an hour or something like that and um, in theory, you should never see that because an employer should be reporting all wages paid, which would include 
tips, and so the hourly weight rate should never equate to that. Um, but that's the, the, when when you ask the question, that's what I was thinking. That's the only way I, I think we would be able to try and analyze it would be to look at unemployment wage information we have and to see who was, <laughs> uh, if anyone was receiving a, a federal minimum wage, but. Uh, we wouldn't know, um, just based on the wage information, we wouldn't know if the individual was a student or if the individual was uh, working in a, in a particular industry. So it would require a lot of um, investigation to, to kind of drill down to that level. Representative Fields, if um, some, a 16 or 17 year old has dropped out of high school, are they considered um, still under the uh, student wage law? Um, they would not be a student at that point. So I would say they would be entitled to Vermont minimum wage, unless some other minimum wage exemption applies. Mm -hmm. or a waiter um, felt like their tips were being changed due to sexual harassment that they would not report that to you is that correct they would report that to the Attorney General's office is that that's where they should report it if if we received a wage complaint um, that included some allegation that the wages they were receiving or the tips they were getting were somehow related to sexual harassment by the employer, we would certainly refer that to the Civil Rights Division of the Attorney General's Office. Um, but we, we don't have a enforcement of authority over the, uh, the sexual harassment piece of it, but we would refer that to the AG's office. We can look into a wage violation. Yes. But in the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, <coughs> so we have a phone. A customer got a phone. Madam Chair. This is Jed Davis, owner of the Farmhouse Group. We had a couple of other restaurant people that we tried to get in today. And people uh, you they, suggested, Heidi, but we couldn't get them today. Trying to both traveling, I've offered them a day for they preferred mornings. I've offered them a day for next week. We need to do that. Okay, perfect. Good. So, uh, Madam, Madam Chair. Just, yes. Um, I, I would, ran into the uh, president of the Farm Bureau. Uh, and uh, he'd like to uh, offer their perspective uh, from the uh, Vermont farmers. So I pass that on. Ron Wild, and you're you're on to the committee. Good good morning, Jed. This is Helen Head. Oh, hi, Helen. How are you? Hi, I'm Ron. fine, thanks. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. I'm, I'm here with other members of the committee from around the state, and um, would appreciate your your thoughts about um, a tipped minimum wage. Sure. Uh, well, I wrote a statement. I can just read it. It'll take a couple of minutes. Is that that's, okay? that's fine. Before you jump into that, though, could you just identify yourself by name and your and your work for the record? Yeah. Uh, Jed Davis. I own the Farmhouse Group, family of restaurants based in Chittenden County. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh huh. Please do. Okay. Um, many of the restaurants. Okay. I've been meeting regularly to discuss the minimum wage law changes being contemplated by your committee. Uh, it has been a very positive and productive discussion process that includes well-intentioned small business owners around the state. 
there's no us versus them mentality in these discussions. In fact, most of us worked ourselves as dishwashers, waiters, cooks, and the like in our early days. This is not a Walton family versus low-wage earners debate. Rather, it is a collection of small business owners who rely on their employees and employees who rely on their employers to make a living. I own four restaurants and a catering company with about 175 employees, all in Chittenden County. Most of our employees are full-time and receive benefits, such as paid vacation and access to our company-sponsored health insurance plan. I feel proud that I can offer competitive wages and important benefits to my employees. Generally speaking, I am a supporter of minimum wage increases in Vermont and on a national level. On a national level in particular, minimum wage has been held tragically low for decades and change should occur in my opinion. Though I should point out that I am probably an outlier in the industry with this opinion and I greatly respect the opinions of my contemporaries. However, I am concerned about continuing to have the tipped minimum wage determined as 50% of the state minimum. The tipped minimum wage could increase sharply to $7.50 an hour in a short period of time. This increase may not sound like much, but it's actually a very steep increase that would greatly affect the health of Vermont's restaurant and tourism industry. There are a few factors unique to the tipped minimum wage that I hope are considered by the committee. First, tourism or restaurant industry employers are required to ensure that all tipped employees achieve the state minimum for all hours worked. If an employee's tips fall short of achieving the state minimum, the employer must make up the difference. Tipped employees will continue to have this minimum wage safeguard regardless of whether the tipped minimum is 525 or 750 and regardless of whether the state minimum is 1050 or 15. Second, a typical tipped employee's total income, their wage plus their tips, already exceeds state minimum wage. Tipped employees can achieve one and a half to times to four times the current minimum of 1050. Increasing the tipped minimum from 525 to 750 would be giving a raise to employees who already exceed, or in some cases well exceed, the state minimum wage at a significant cost to restaurant industry employers. Lastly, the majority of a restaurant's hours logged are at the tips minimum wage. Successful restaurants should be able to handle the minimum wage increase of 1050 up to 15 for our cooks, dishwashers, and back of house employees over the next several years, in my opinion. In fact, these wages are already trending well above 1050 due to employee shortages throughout the state. However, an increase of the tipped minimum wage from 525 to 750 would change the profitability of restaurants significantly. And these pay increases would go to a set of employees who are already exceeding the state minimum. I hope the committee will consider decoupling the tipped minimum wage from the state minimum wage as you consider your options. Rather, tie the tipped minimum wage to an inflationary increase or some other modest measure. This will allow the restaurant and tourism industry to better accept other changing expenses, such as upward wage trends, rising raw materials expenses, the cost of health care and employee shortages issues. Allowing the tipped minimum wage to increase to 750 in the face of other cost increases that the restaurant industry faces will truly jeopardize continued operations for many Vermont restaurants. And these pay increases would be going to a set of employees who already exceed the state minimum wage. This seems counterproductive. I hope this committee will consider decoupling the tipped minimum wage from the state minimum wage discussion. Thank you. Um, we have a, at least a couple of questions here, Jed. Um, first from Representative Stevens from Waterbury. Jed, can you take a, a half a step back and just talk about the, uh, the salary structures in your restaurants in terms of um, front of house, back of house, who gets minimum wage anyway? And, and you, you touched upon the fact that there's a great com competition for, for, for back of house people especially, but um, can, you just, can you just give us, a, give us a, a broader picture of how you pay wages in your, uh, in your restaurants? 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure I heard most of your questions, so I'm, I'll do my best here. But um, yeah, if you're talking about back of house, well, first of all, the managers in the company either receive a, a, a salary um, or a uh, you know what I would call a high hourly rate. Um, we do make a firm commitment to our salaried staff that they will work what what we would call a normal schedule, a five-day work week, two consecutive days off in a row. Um, and those salaries are, are, I would say, highly competitive for the market. Um, back of house employees, um, you know, entry level, which would be, let's say, dishwashers, prep cooks, um, you know, those wages are already, for us anyway, starting above the state minimum. We're probably at 12 or 12.50. This is the starting wage. Um, we have, we are, we're still a pretty young company. We'll, our first flagship restaurant will, uh, it will be eight years old in May. We have back house employees that have been with us since day one, and those folks are probably in the 18, 1850, 19, 1950 an hour range. Um, a, what I would call a highly skilled line cook, or a skilled line cook that's capable of working several stations in our kitchen would probably start at around 16 or 1650. Um, there is definitely, I think you touched on this, um, a lot of competition out there for uh, skilled employees, you know, we think we offer a good competitive um, and, and positive uh, job experience. So we, we always feel like we're capable of attracting good people, but there's no question there's, there are less applicants today for jobs, job postings than there were say five years ago. And that's, and that's true front of house employees too, I think, um, but we probably just feel that a, a little more acutely with our back of house employees. Yeah. Okay. Representative Walls? Yes, I'd like a clarification, please. Uh, maybe I'm just confused and you can help me out. Uh, I think you said a couple of times that all of your employees are earning above the minimum wage. So, uh, at least in your case, I'm not sure why you would object to increasing the tip wage minimum since that wouldn't seem to affect you at all. Are you advocating for the places where that's not the case? Um, I, again, I think I heard your question right. Um, so they, they currently, uh, it, in increasing the, the tip minimum um, wage from five and a quarter to seven fifty would, would absolutely affect the expenses for the restaurant for my restaurant mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. um, those employees are paid five and a quarter an hour now, so moving that to seven fifty would be a two dollar and twenty five cent per hour increase to those employees across the board. But Did I, I answer have, that right? Did well, I hear the question? My question right? was I understood you say they were already earning more than that. So I'm not their sure tips. why you would... Through their tips. They're earning more than that through their through tips. Their tips. Okay. I misunderstood. Okay, thank you. Right, so if they're making five and a quarter plus $20 an hour in tips, um, you know, I'm fulfilling my obligation, paying them five and a quarter, and obviously they are exceeding ten fifty. So giving them a $2.25 an hour raise, um, you know, would, would increase my my expense significantly. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you meant okay. your base rate was higher than the minimum. All right, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions? I think, do we have written, do we have a written testimony from you, Jed? Are you able to, to forward what you read to us to uh, sure. our committee assistant or, or to me? Uh, and I can make sure that uh, we get it into the record. That would that would yeah. be great. You've got my email, so. I'll say I have your and Ron's. I'll send it okay. to you. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Great. Uh, here's another question from Representative Stevens. Jed, have you ever had to make up 
uh, an employee's salary if they didn't make enough in tip wages? Yeah, it, it's very rare. Um, it's very rare. Um, and typically, when that arises, it's, you know, the, the classic case would be some sort of, you know, snowy Monday night when we expect that it's going to be slow. And we determine that we're going to cut a server from their shift early. And perhaps they didn't earn enough tips. So then we look at it and we we just make an adjustment in our payroll and put them in at 1050 for that hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever it is that they work. But it's very rare. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jed, again, thank you for weighing in with us. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye now. Bye. Okay. Um, so, Ron, we had some people waiting in the wings. Okay, Ashley. Okay, Ashley. Yep. Okay. Welcome. And while you're getting up, I'll just mention that occasionally, I, as I uh, sort of my eyes run the room, I see that there are people who are here that may have some, something to contribute. Our format is such that it's hard for us to have open discussions and have uh, contributions from people who are not in the witness seat. It becomes hard to, to figure out how to manage the response, to, to then interpret the record of who spoke when. If you're here and you've not testified and you have something to offer, please make a note of it and uh, let us know so that we can get you on the witness list. Uh, we're happy to hear from those people who have something to contribute. Uh, in fact, we really welcome it. So, uh, welcome Ashley. Thank you. And I want to clarify too that my testimony is not um, focused on the tip minimum wage, um, just because I was early. I was supposed to be speaking a little bit later, and then scheduling conflicts. So. Okay. Um, so, at this point, I think most of you are familiar with Main Street Alliance. We're a small business organization statewide. We have about 600 members. And we are really committed to elevating the voices of small businesses on public policy. We um, have been working with our members in some form for a number of years on this issue through surveys. And then this summer, we hosted a working group to, with any business owner who wanted to join to discuss um, kind of a lay of the land, what the legislature was looking at, what the study committee was looking at, um, and then coming together to kind of develop what we see as the best path forward. So we, I'll go through the survey. Ron, if you want to scroll down a little bit. I'll go the oh, okay. I'm not the most exact. Um, so I'll just start to talk, talk a little bit about our survey. We, um, as an organization, we're consistently doing an ongoing door-to-door -door in person survey with small businesses statewide. We surveyed on the issue of minimum wage, and um, I have data here from the last couple of years. The first, the first year, the survey was it was this in oh 2016. Um, the respondents were, or two, oh, sorry, yes, the respond, the number of respondents for the surveys was 230. I didn't realize that I had written that there. And we asked respondents if they supported raising the minimum wage to 1250. And you can see the differences between the two years. They're actually fairly similar in the responses that um, businesses said in 2016 that they would, 65% said there would be no impact and in 2017, 58 said no impact. And then um, the percentages decreased for modest and significant impact. So this was just, the purpose of the, these questions was really to just see um, how businesses, bottom lines would be impacted by raising minimum wage at two different levels. And this was a little bit before the legislature was publicly, I think, discussing moving to 15. Um, we also asked, then we asked it, what the impact would be of raising the, the minimum wage to $15. And um, you can see that a significant number said um, no impact, but then also a fairly large number said significant impact. And then we asked questions about if the respondents would support raising the minimum wage to $12.50 and to $15 over time. Um, and you can see that there is. Question I, I just want to be clear in the question you're asking, does that mean 
1250 now, 15 now, or, or 2024? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the language in the survey didn't specify, specify but the respondent informed the, um, the survey participants that it was, it would be um, standard practice to have it be a trajectory over time, essentially. So in 2016 and 17, oh, we didn't survey on this in 2017, sorry. Um, in 2016, we found that um, there was strong support for going to minimum wage of 1250, uh, 1250 an hour. And then in 2016 and 17, when we surveyed on support for raising the minimum wage to 15 over time, we still found um, strong support in both years for, for raising over time. Um, and so, these survey results in all of the issues that we work on, I think I've, we've talked about these results that we've done for uh, our family medical leave insurance and other issues. Um, they're not, these don't set our policy positions, but they help our board and leadership form what our policy positions are. Um, and so these survey results we also brought to our working group, which we held this summer, which had, um, I think it was around 25 business owners from eight different counties. We had um, really good turnout, we thought, for this. And we brought these mm. survey results to the working group. We um, went over the um, any data we had related to minimum wage, again, talked about what the legislature was looking at, what the rationale is behind raising the minimum wage, uh, what other states have done. We did some education and then had a facilitated discussion about exactly what, what kind of path forward could, could we um, envision and I think just as an organization we try really hard to not say no to things that are a challenge we really try to to find a compromise in any way that we can um, and so that's really was laid the groundwork for the conversation was we're not going to say that you know this is something that we don't believe in because we all around the table believed in raising the minimum wage to some level it was just a matter of what exactly is the trajectory and so um, that was how we began our, our conversation. And so from this working group, we developed, um, collectively developed a proposal, which if you scroll down, um, Representative Howard to here, this was what we uh, came up with, which essentially says that we support the goal of getting to $15 an hour over time. And the trajectory that we recommend um, is based on essentially taking the, the language that exists in current statute that says um, we suggest, that says the minimum wage increases will increase annually by inflation or CPI, whichever is less, and change it to say whichever is more until you reach your goal of 15. And so at that timeline, you can see that we would get to, 1477 in, in 2025. And so this was the proposal that from the study group we all recommended, um, we developed and recommended to the study committee in the Senate and also testified to the second Senate Economic Development Committee to say that this was the timeline that we <coughs> felt um, made the most sense. Um, and ultimately we support raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour and we wanted to make sure that it, we could do it in a way that really worked for the small business community. So, um, so this was the this was our is our recommendation as an organization. Representative Strong. Thank you, Ashley. Was there any talk among your businesses about um, let's say Chittenden County did this? As a, mm -hmm. as a trial and, um, and let the more rural areas adjust accordingly. But I know it's a different dynamic, yeah. rural versus more city. Um, would, have they had that discussion? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think just in general, um, our members and business owners that I've spoken with feel that when we talk about things like minimum wage, that the purpose of it is to be a minimum standard. And so regardless of location of the state, that it it wouldn't make sense to um, have different standards for different locations, mm -hmm. even though recognizing that rural areas, businesses in rural areas generally face challenges with fewer customers and 
um, and having a harder time finding employees that all of these things were taken into consideration when this proposal was put together. Representative Christie. Uh, during the discussion, uh, uh, dovetailing on uh, uh, Representative Strong's uh, comment, mm -hmm. was it the concern that if there were different uh, let's say by county, mm -hmm. let's say one county was at 12 and another one was at 10, that there'd be migrations? Was that part of the conversation? I think, yeah, I think just in general, there is the belief um, that, and I mean, it just seems, there's, I don't have data to back this up, but we, we could understand how if certain areas of the state were paying better wages than others, then it may impact their ability to find qualified employees also, I would imagine. But I think these were conversations that were had in the working group, but they're not necessarily. Yeah. Ashley, thanks. I want to thank you for um, not for coming at us with a like, proposed solution instead of just that we don't like it or we like it yeah. and, and a nice compromise there. So thank you for that, it's refreshing. And um, the, the only comment I would make is, the only thing that I would be uncomfortable with a, with a static percentage mm -hmm. is that, especially through, through um, uh, a time, let's see, like four years, whether it's 2024, 2026, is that it, it, it negates the effect of, of the economy. You could have a recession in there, you could mm -hmm. have a boom in there, and, and, and businesses react one way or the other with, you know, right now we're all overpaying because, you know, there's right. a greater demand and supply, um, and it can go the other way. So th that, would, that would be, you know, really kind of like my only issue with approach, approaching it that way with this static percentage number. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of get locked into something without without taking the external forces into consideration. That's why I like the inflationary index that right. tracks that. Yeah. There's, and there might be other uh, other uh, economic indicators that it could follow mm -hmm. that take into account you know, the national economy. But, yeah. And I just want to reiterate, we're supportive of minimum wage. We support getting to a minimum wage that we feel will, is a livable wage that would help people su sustain their livelihoods. And we leave it up to um, you know, your discretion to figure out the timeline. But this was what we recommended from our working group. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ash. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Nice so Ron, where do we stand in, in our efforts to try and Encourage people who are on the afternoon list. They in. like their spot, right? They now, like right? their <laughs> spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's too bad. Well, here, Fair for different, enough. different reasons. Some uh, were elsewhere out of the building. Some okay. were still formulating their, their thoughts. So. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, and, um, and hopefully we won't have a long floor, so we'll be able to get through this afternoon. Um, I'll just remind members that we're usual at a point where we're scheduling for next week and um, so if you know of people who are interested in testifying or people that you want to have clarified points I know different members have passed on ideas already and, we, and, I, and I as I've gotten them I've fed them in July um, but um, I'm, I'm really hoping that we can um, uh, focus what testimony we need next week. We'll have the, the public hearing a week from today, and that we'll be in a position to vote this early the following week. So now is the time to, to um, bring forward any names or mm -hmm. ideas, topics that, that we want to see developed more fully. Thank you. 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 Thank